Imagine a place where horses trot down buggy paths to deliver groceries right to your front door. Where a soprano sings an aria so beautiful that it breathes new life into an old inn. Homes glowing well into the night as families and friends gather to love, laugh, live, and celebrate. A place where gossamer drifts in the wake of a pony following its new owner home. Kids racing across rolling hills looking for adventure and stone walls stretching on forever. This place is real. This is our place. This is the story of New Canaan. And how do we know? Because of the generations that came and stayed and shared the stories of their lives with us. The Stuarts loaded horse-drawn wagons with groceries and sent them to homes throughout the community, beginning a web of paths that would connect us all. The Francos popped the cork, celebrating the end of Prohibition, and kept the libations flowing as they delivered the fruits of the Italian countryside right to Elm Street. The Carls saw the future in cars for every person purpose and brought Chevrolet to town, sending the ponies out to pasture as wheels of progress set new grooves in the old wagon paths. Inspired by the incredible soprano Nellie Melba, the box named their inn after her and made sure it lived up to her standard as they offered newcomers and old friends respite, card games, and companionship. The deans built kitchens where families flourished as they practiced old customs and gave life to new traditions. The Stoddards infused such spontaneity into their work mobilizing the community that a cocktail party yielded a new pony named Patchy. And waves of Ruchi kids cut wide swaths across the open fields on adventures that lasted from dawn until the dinner bell so that they got to know and care for every nook in town. These stories create the legacy we share. These stories underline the importance of having a multi-generational community where juniors and seniors live together and engage with each other. In the spring of 2006, Ellie and Hank O'Neill were at the advent of senior citizenship when they recognized the importance of this synthesis. They immediately called their friends to their living room, proposing the idea of an organization of volunteers that would help them age in place, right at home. They knew that the community they helped forge was full of people who would do just that, volunteer to help them stay, and they were right. Staying Put mobilizes hundreds of New Canaan volunteers of all ages to do what's needed for seniors to stay put. At its core, it's neighbors helping neighbors. Staying Put is a window into New Canaan, a marvelous community born out of symbiotic relationships in a setting so charming, it surpasses the imagination. Hey everybody, Brian Williams here with you. Thank you for having me in, letting me barge into your homes. Thank you for the time you're spending with us for today's event, and thank you for your support. I trust you are all staying put, which, come to think of it, was an idea, a concept, and an organization, in our case, long before it was a necessity during this pandemic of our long year 2020. Uh, I have the great good fortune today of joining you to introduce you to the three most important women in my life. Before I do that, a word about the matriarch in this family. That would be my mother-in-law, Pat Stoddard. Pat and her husband, Hud, longtime New Canaan residents, were among the first, the founding members of those early meetings back when it was an idea a far-off concept back when Ellie O'Neill, among others, launched this idea in a town where we enjoy such terrific public facilities, such first-rate public safety and resources, and first-rate first responders, I might add. Why not, if you possibly could, stay in your home with the comforts of home, your possessions, your things, your peace of mind? and think about the bonus in safety, in peace of mind, 
and in family. In our case, our two children got to grow up a mile away from their grandparents. There is no way to put a price on that kind of quality of life. So without delay, as I said, the three most important women in my life to talk about old times, present day, and perhaps the future of staying put, Pat Stoddard, my wife Jane, and our daughter Allison. So let's start at the beginning, Mom, and tell us what it was that brought you and Dad to New Canaan in the first place. Well, we were living in New York on the Upper East Side in a tiny apartment with an ordinary baby carriage in an area where Rolls Royce baby carriages were the going thing, and we needed, I needed country, and so did Hud. So we started looking. He had good friends whom I'd met out here, the Walworths. They were 15 or 20 years older than me, uh, but Hud had visited them often because his one of his roommates was uh, the younger brother of Nancy Walworth. And they urged us to come, said the schools were marvelous and the town was full of interesting, talented people. So we, we looked out here, didn't find anything we could afford except a three bedroom house that cost $25,500. And I called Nancy and I said, Nancy, go look at that house and tell me just from the outside what you think. She called me back and said, you can't pay 25 dollars for that. Let me call my Smith College classmate, Nell Richmond, and see if her garage by any chance is available for rent. And she did, and it was, and we moved into Nell Richmond's garage, which had three bedrooms. Imagine it was a five-car garage. And uh, we put down roots there, and Nell said, now I want to introduce you to some people your age in New Canaan, since I didn't know anyone my age. And she had a luncheon and she invited, well, they came one by one, each more beautiful and blonde than the next. And they were polite, but uh, not very interested in me. And we sat around Nell's huge lunch table with Nell and they got talking about the party they'd been to the prior Saturday night where I can't remember whether it was the women or the men who put their shoes in the middle of the room and the other sex grabbed a shoe and went home with its owner. And I went home to Hud and I said, my God, where have we moved? Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, he, he was, well, I was, I said, how do you know they're all going to feel obligated to invite us now that Nell is, well, never heard from one of them. So that took care of that. Well, first of all, that story about the shoes is incredible. And years later, of course, we'd have the film, The Ice Storm, set here, uh, written by a, a guy who grew up in Darien. And he used keys as a key party. But I always thought, well, that can't possibly have happened. So now we know it did happen. And it happened with shoes. And I know and that it you happened in, It happened in the 1950s. The ice yeah. storm was not until the 1970s. Right. So this was the quiet, silent, well-behaved generation going ape in sleepy New Canaan. Um, I, I think back to what a trusting community we were. Babysitters, if we wanted to go someplace, and, and we did, by the time you'd spent all day with three little kids, um, there was an agency run by a woman named Adele Austin, and you paid an annual fee to Adele and if you called her sufficiently in advance, she would provide you with a babysitter. And you accepted whoever that was, somebody you may have never seen before walks in your house, and you tell her where you're going, and you tell her when you'll be home. This is the babysitter, not Adele. And you trust her. And when I think of that, I'm in a way horrified uh, we trusted her to have vetted these people, and she did. And as, I don't know how you look back on that, uh, whether you remember any of them, we had no disasters, and we got, we got to 
we've cultivated a stable of favorites. And if we ask them ahead of time and then called Adele and made sure she was in the loop, uh, it was okay with her. It solved her, saved her some efforts too. One other thing I think about is the fact that we always had a volunteer fire department here and now it's combination volunteer and professional, but we had a fire horn in town that was how everybody knew, the volunteers and everybody else, where the fire was. So there was a horn and I'm not sure where it was, whether it was on top of the fire house or town hall, but it kind of went bomb, 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 and every street had a code. I remember our street was 412 and that was also the first three digits of the LeBlanc's phone number. So I would stop and listen wherever I was. And if the first number was four, I would stop and think and wait, you know, you wanted to know where that fire was and whether it was near your house or somebody you knew. And I, it must have driven the people who lived near it crazy, but it was wonderful for all the rest of us to be able to hear it and know and for the volunteers to be able to get up and go. That's how they knew where to go. Mm -hmm. well, Allison, how does this sound compared to the town you grew up in? Um, so, so different. I think the biggest difference probably is just the size of the town. When I grew up, I was born in 1988. I was technically born at Stanford Hospital, but I, then we moved very quickly to New Canaan when I was, I don't know, was I one? Maybe. About, one yeah. Um, and it never felt, it always felt small by comparison to where my friends lived. And once I went to college and I started meeting more people from different places, it was definitely small, but it wasn't 10,000 people small. And um, I just look back on it as having felt like a very safe place to grow up in most ways. There was one major weather event in my whole childhood that Mimi, you were at our house for. There was like a giant storm with really high winds that might have even formed into a tornado at some somewhere in town and Mimi was outside with our dog um, and had to pull her into this barn in the backyard to get out of the wind other than that there were no you know volcanoes I was terrified of volcanoes when I was little there were no <laughs> volcanoes in New Canaan there were no giant tornadoes all the time like in the Wizard of Oz it felt like a very safe place as a kid and it even felt safe in terms of feeling free to be a kid I felt like um, as much as this must have been a menace to all of the adults around town, when um, school got out, sometimes we would go into town and we were allowed to just sort of, as long as we left our backpacks outside of the stores that we weren't bulls and china shops knocking everything over, we were allowed to just roam around the town and, and people trusted us to behave ourselves and we did for the most part. And um, I just always, when people ask me where I grew up, I say it was the kind of town where I left all my worldly possessions in the form of a backpack on the sidewalk at least once a week to go roam around a store. And in most places in the world, that idea is impossible. Um, and so it was a very, um, I mean, I will say it, it is a pretty, or my experience of New Canaan has been a pretty homogenous community. And I think that aspect of it required some uh, some careful work on the part of my parents and my grandparents of trying to remind my brother and me that this was not what America looked like. This is not how America lived. This is, we are very lucky to live here. We're very fortunate. It's your responsibility to give back. Um, and so I'm also fortunate that that was baked into my understanding of where I lived was that it was a place that felt really safe and I was very lucky to feel so safe on a regular basis. Now let's talk a little bit about the town as a community. You and I both have seen it grow dramatically and change somewhat in some ways. It's fancier than it used to be and, and bigger in terms of population. The core of it though, still seems to be this strong sense of community where people take care of each other. And talking right now as we are in this COVID period, we've seen that again with people going out and shopping for others who can't, uh, the community really trying to come together at a tough time to do what's right. What's your sense of all that? Um, it is, as you described, it always was. There have been very strong, good 
people willing to take on leadership roles in this town, whether it's being the head of the planning and zoning commission or a member of it. I mean, there's a really demanding job. Uh, there have simply been people who stepped up and volunteered and organized Get About and, uh, and all the other marvelous volunteer organizations. Tell me what was the first volunteer experience you had and what were the kinds of things you and dad got involved in in town? Well, Nancy Walworth had HUD picked out for the school board, which was sort of a natural because his dad had been superintendent of schools all over the U.S. And HUD was very interested. So they got him onto a committee that was studying the curriculum at Sachs. And from there, <clears throat> well, he got to know enough people so, so that he ran for the school board. It was a, as you know, it is a, a partisan. Uh, you have to be a Democrat or a Republican to be elected to the school board. So he ran and was elected and was elected again and eventually was elected chairman, which he, he took great pride in because as a Democrat, you don't often get elected chairman in this town of any of anything, or at least you didn't back then. Um, and he'd come home from the office 7, 7.30, read a story to the kids, gobble a bite, and get to the school board meeting by 8.30. And I didn't see a whole lot of him on those particular nights, but it was deeply rewarding for him. He felt he was useful and effective. Um, and he was. And you at the same time were involved in League of Women Voters and I know you were involved in our nursery school. I was involved in the community nursery school. That was the first board I was on. And through that, um, the community nursery school ran the uh, modern house tour, invented it. Uh, Wu Lee, who was the wife of architect John Blackley, uh, dreamt it up with John and and so that was fun. I got to know the modern architects in their houses and I, I was a, uh, a tour guide at Philip Johnson's house once on a house tour and he showed me around beforehand and he said now they're going to ask you where I keep my pajamas and you tell them here and he put his hand up against a cupboard behind his bed and he said actually, I don't wear any. <laughs> so I, I, I told that story, which he obviously wanted me to tell. But that was, that was fun. But think back, 1956, no ambulance. Yeah. Think of that, no EMTs, um, no Lapham Community Center, no Waveney Care Center. The old high school was, I mean, this high school then was what's now Sachs. Uh, no Irwin Park, no New Canaan Community Foundation, no Get About, no Staying Put. It was a very simple community. We had our milk delivered, do you remember that? At Deep yes. Farms in actual bottles with the cream on the top few inches, um, in, you know, in glass bottles. No cell phones, God knows, no computers, typewriters. And actually very little traffic. I was thinking about the fact that uh, mom and dad went to a party one Saturday night and came home having purchased a pony for $200 uh, because a friend of my grandmother's had given them some money to buy Christmas presents and they bought a pony. And first of all, imagine being able to buy a pony for $200. But second, imagine buying one at a party and then figuring out what to do with it. And we had an old barn in the back of our house. Sight unseen. Sight unseen. And home came the pony and it started what was a wonderful, wonderful chapter in my life. A lot of work for everybody else because dad had to build pastures and you had to work too. It was a lot of work, but a lot of fun. And nobody's properties were all that valuable. So the boundaries didn't seem all that important. So you could ride a pony and people did all through people's property and back around and 
we used to ride downtown and um, that just wasn't a big deal. There weren't huge numbers of cars and traffic I'm sure felt heavy to those who had lived here for decades before we got here, but it was pretty easy. And when a pony got loose and ran across town, that wasn't the end of the world either. It was, it was quite um, low key here. The cops would call up and say, your pony is at, I mean, they knew the pony. <laughs> and we'd go down and somehow took Jane with me, drove down, picked up the pony, and she rode it home from wherever it was. Yeah, and there was a pony from Parade Hill Lane who used to show up at our house a lot. And anyway, it was a different time. This is just as wonderful, and the towns are quite different. Mom. I want to ask you, what is your favorite smell in New Canaan? I went back to South School, probably five, which means it was 10 years ago. And I walked in the door, even though the building is quite different from how it was when I was a little kid, it still smelled the same. It was a smell I didn't even know that I knew, but you know how you walk into a building and something hits you. I walked into that building and I just boom, was back to being a little kindergartner, first grader. And it reminded me that it was there in first grade in Fran Molinari's class when she got the phone call uh, and had a phone on her wall, all the teachers did in every classroom and started to cry. And we learned that President Kennedy had been assassinated. And of course we were very young, just at that age where you're learning to read and uh, that image is seared into my brain of her being so upset, as well as other teachers who walked in. And then I think we, we went home from school. We could walk home from school. Does that make sense, Mom, that we, we left and went home? Uh, I got a call from the superintendent asking how he could reach HUD, who was chairman of the school board. And he called HUD, and they decided that kids should be sent home. And so, yes, you were sent home by bus, and meanwhile, I had turned on the TV and I was weeping myself, I'm sure, when, when uh, and Alex would not have been in school yet. He would have been too young, but you and Dan would have come home. That's correct, and, and watched for the next three days, those incredible events. So mom, speaking of New Canaan favorite smells, do you have one? Yeah, probably my own backyard, because I love to grow things. And with luck, some of them smell simply wonderful. They um, do. And then I have a little greenhouse, so things smell good all winter, too. Yes, yeah. Mom has a real green thumb. And uh, having moved into the house that I grew up in as an adult and trying to live up to that gardening has been a, a tall order. I'm not nearly as good at it as she is, but it is fun. And it is a good smell. Sitting as we are in the middle of this COVID period, and we were all hoping to be together for this and are in our homes and Zooming, um, I've been struck spending so much time with our children and, of course, with my mom by the things that have stayed the same here. The fact that when times are tough, people do pull together, they take care of their neighbors. This is a very caring place, and it is also a place where people do really get involved spend endless amounts of hours uh, in service to the community and to their neighbors and take care of each other. And Allison and I um, went together to the Black Lives Matter March. And from my experience here, I expected, I don't know, maybe 25 or 50 people to show up and to, for us to arrive at, the, um, at Saks, make our way there that afternoon and see a couple thousand people peacefully marching together from there down to the police station and then back again was so moving. And in a way, that combination of uh, you know, public consciousness and awareness that we're part of a, um, a much bigger country and a much bigger world, while at the same time, that deep personal care and involuntarism in our community really very special. And um, I think for everybody in our family and probably everybody who is participating today, that community involvement has been really, really important. Very true. I, well, of the group, I've definitely done the least amount of volunteer works in 
my time in New Canaan, you guys have done significantly more. But um, I, I echo that because it just feels like there are many times a year, and especially during the summer when the farmer's market is happening, where the town sort of descends on a location regularly and you are reminded of the fact that um, people are good and want to help each other and want to look out for each other and care about each other. And this year when we all had to stay at least six feet away from each other, um, it never occurred to anyone to just keep everyone away. It just was to do it safely. So that, that sense of community and that sense of belonging could continue to be part of the DNA of our town. It just had to be altered to be safe. And um, even the sort of Zoom downtown experience, the efforts to revitalize local businesses in the face of this epidemic that we didn't know, this pandemic that we didn't know what the, um, how long the businesses were gonna have to be functioning the way they were. It's just a town that really looks after its own. And um, that's always been impressed upon me because when my grandparents got here pretty much immediately, uh, Mimi, you guys were starting to volunteer in many different ways. And that continues to this day, obviously. It's a huge part of your experience of New Canaan. It is and has been such a privilege both to grow up here and then to have our children grow up here with their grandparents in town is so special. And it's not unique. Many of you who are watching this today are also in, in the same situation or have been. I'm told that there's something like 200 families in New Canaan that have multiple generations at the same time, that there are three generations. And so it's a very powerful and very lucky experience. And I do think that provides a real core, at least for my own lifetime, it has. It's community. It's that sense of, um, it takes a village, you know. I think it's, it's huge because the other thing was about being a knucklehead running around town. If I got in trouble, they were gonna know either, one of you, <laughs> whoever I was in trouble with was going to know either my grandparents or my parents and without, pretty much without exception. And so it felt like parents were everywhere and everyone was someone's kid. And in that way, there is something really special about that. And it's also, I think, kind of the way we're built fundamentally and it's just a failing uh, on many levels that everyone doesn't get to have that experience and that it's one reserved for the luckiest of the lucky. But, um, but yeah, I certainly do feel fortunate for having had that experience. Mom, tell us a little bit about how the concept of staying put came about and how you and your group of friends worked to bring it to New Canaan. It was all the idea of Eleanor O'Neill, who lives on, up on the West Road and has for a long time. She read an article in the New York Times about a group in Boston called Beacon Hill Village, which was just that sort of group, self-organized group of people who knew they would need more services as they got older and organized as, as volunteers, um, paid an association fee so that they could hire a staff to help them. And anyhow, Ellie read this article she called people up, including me, and said, did I think it, that might go? And I, next thing I knew, she and her husband, Henry, who has since died, got together a group of community leaders and friends like Hud and me uh, to talk about it. And there was huge enthusiasm for this concept. And by the end of the meeting, uh, she had a list of people who volunteered and we were just people who volunteered and we went to work and it was a complicated job inventing it was great fun to be part of starting a nonprofit. you need a set of bylaws before you can get a tax deduction i mean we learned an awful lot and had a great deal of volunteer help from the lawyer who did our bylaws, Tom O'Day, and, and various others. It took us about two years to get organized. And here we are now, what, 12 years later, I think, something like that. And during this terrible time, staying put as, as have all other volunteer groups. 
And now it's become a model for other communities. I know that all of you field phone calls from communities that don't have these services and wish they did, or some have started programs that are similar, but you're right during COVID, especially what a difference it's made for seniors who may be alone and are staying home and also need the support community and services that staying put provides. Well, Barb Achenbaum and her staff are doing a marvelous job and it's not been easy during this time at all. They risk their own health to help others, uh, but they're cautious. So I think seniors have been absolutely vital and just want to say to staying put, I really don't know how this community would be doing today without staying put because as we know, it's filled a really important role and under the leadership of Barb Ackenbaum and her predecessors done an extraordinary job. Um, so I just want to shout out to them. They're the reason we're here and also to the 200 other families who could be here telling their stories and we'd be listening to them. I'd love to hear your stories sometime and feel very privileged to have shared this community with you and your families all these years. So thank you. Stay well, everybody. And we look forward to getting together when we can. I just wish we could all be in the same room, seeing one another, saluting one another. During this COVID thing, it's very lonely when you're older and living alone and it would just be such fun. So one of these days when we can do that, let's do that. And thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm Barb Ackenbaum, Executive Director at Staying Put. And I'd just like to take a few moments to thank some of the many people who made today's event possible. First, of course, thank you to the three amazing generations of Stoddard and Williams women, Pat, Jane, and Allison, whose conversation about staying put in New Canaan I know resonated with all of us. Second, thank you to our luncheon sponsors whose generosity ensures that our event will be a success. We are especially grateful to Dee Dee and Jim Bartlett, the Anderson Fund, April and Kelly at William Ravis, and Amy and Fabio Freire. Our co-chairs, Kelly DeFrancisco and Sharon Pierce, both staying put board members, provided invaluable guidance and leadership. And our producer slash cameraman slash strategist, Bob Doran, lent both talent and inspiration. I also wanna recognize my dedicated team at Staying Put, as well as the hundreds of volunteers from every generation who are here to help Staying Put members every day. Staying Put New Canaan is a community of friends from across the generations committed to helping older adults live independently, safely, and actively engaged in the community. The reason we've been so successful since we opened our doors in 2008, and now through these recent challenging times, is because of the tremendous support we get from people of all ages in the New Canaan community. I hope that the next time we gather together, it will be in one room brimming with generations of families and friends. In the meantime, we still have much to say. Okay, so I, I guess we should be kind of getting back to the office. That was fun. Uh, that wait, was hey, fun. Wait, is, is that who I think it is? I, gosh, it is! Great. Staying Put gives the most wonderful parties. Yeah, well, here when, we are. When we were inventing Staying Put, which was Ellie O'Neill's idea, it, it was because Ellie and I were probably then about 75, and we thought one of these days we're going to be really over the hill. Never. And we're going to need a lot of help. So here we are, and not only do we get help. Well, it's we, 11 years later, right? But uh, I guess that's right. Yeah. But we have the, such fun things to do. We go to parties, we go to dinners, we go to lectures. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know what, I think obviously we work at the organization so we're biased, but it's just one of the best things in our town and I think there's really a lot of reasons that we should be celebrating. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, 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 you're picking up the music. Let's go.
Take it away, come on.